listeners. It's every other Sunday again, and I'm Ronnie Lipschutz. You're listening to Sustainability Now, a K-Squid radio station focused on environment, sustainability, and social justice in the Monterey Bay region, California, and the world. My guest today is ceramic artist Jeffrey Downing, professor of art at San Francisco State University. He was featured a few years, a few weeks ago in the San Francisco Chronicle for his environmental sculpture in Richardson Bay, designed to mark today's king tides, which will be exacerbated in the future by rising sea levels. Maritime and canine themes are often present in his work. Hi, Jeff. Are you there? Hi, Ronnie. How are you? It's good to talk to you. I want to read a little bit more about you before we, we start uh, our discussion. Uh, The Mission Clay website, which uh, features some of his work, reports that Jeff Downing's sculpture is informed by the humor and pop sensibility of the California artist Robert Arnson, by the stripped-down economy of Alberto Giacometti's figures, and by the spontaneity and energy characteristic of the work of Pablo Picasso. That's a lot of shoes to fill. Downing's work with dog imagery depends on chance discovery of form, but seeks to invoke feelings concerning the human condition and our varied relationship with the natural world. In Jeff Downing's worldview, studying the dog with all of its expressiveness, intelligence, and sensitivity leads us to a better understanding of the connection between culture and nature. Uh, I want to talk uh, later on about dogs as well. But uh, as I said, welcome to Sustainability Now. Last summer, Oakland-based artist Marisha Farnsworth was a guest on the show. She works mostly with landscapes and environmental installations. Your work seems to be more about the placement and significance of the objects you create in various settings and contexts. I want to hear more about your history and background, but let's start with a basic question. How do you understand or explain environmental art, and do you categorize your work uh, in this way? Yeah, uh, you know... um you know, environmental art can is pretty broad. It can be really anything. And I think, you know, as long as humans have been making imagery a lot, you know, when it involves nature, I consider that environmental art. It, you know, really as an art movement, it started in the 1960s um, with the land artists like Robert Smithson, uh, Smithson with the spiral jetty. Um, and, you know, it can be as broad as like land art, earth art, sustainable art. Um, even eco art, conceptual art, or social practice. Um, I think that environmental artists, what they do is they make these great monumental works that are really outside of the gallery and the museum setting. And they also, um, not not all, but most are trying to raise awareness of environmental problems. So um, how do you decide what to make and where to put it? Usually location is the first thing. Um, if I see if I see an environmental problem existing, then I might I, I I would try to get an idea to see how I can raise awareness about that. Um, first, I might see a, a place that's been disrupted by humans, and I'm inspired to make a piece to draw attention to that issue. Or I might even think of a piece first, and then go, have to go find the place to put it, find the location. Um, some pieces I make are portable. So um, I can take them to different locations. I, some of them are sort of temporary shows that I may, may have been put up for just three or four hours. And I'll find a location where there's a lot of foot traffic or people around that would notice me doing it. And I'll put the piece up and draw attention to, the, to what's happening at the location just temporarily. And then I'll just take the piece up. So it's either location first or, uh, you know, with a problem, or I make a piece and take it to locations. 
And, <clears throat> and, and how do you get the ideas? I mean, the specific ideas. I will talk about specific ideas in a few minutes, but, but you know, what, what inspires you to, to come up with one thing or another? You know, usually it's like, I think about like things like, you know, you know, I'm working on a sea level rise project now and it's really like how to draw attention to it. And I often think about like uh, just the aesthetic, the beauty aesthetic that draws people's eyes to things. And a lot, you know, that works a lot in art and just so people would notice something like I think about like even, you know, really great graffiti artists that have a message in their work. But first it's like this kind of collage of letters and numbers and people are drawn to it. And then the way that they look closer, they, they learn to understand it. So I think it's probably a st- aesthetic first, and then that draws in people to look at it. And then once they look at it, then they realize that there's an issue behind it. Um, one example is, you know, with the sea level rise project that I'm working on now, I was looking at some um, uh, exhibits that were put up, uh, one in San Francisco at Marina Green, and it's an exhibit about sea level rise, and it's really just a pole with a stripes on it and little dots. And I, you know, I sat by that exhibit for like an hour and watched people just walk by, and nobody really noticed it because it was just a pole. So <laughs> that, that inspired me to make something that was more noticeable first, and then have the cause behind it. Well, let's let's come back to that one, uh, that particular project, a little bit later, okay? Because I do okay. want to talk okay. about it. Yeah. So, so you've now been a professor of art at SF State for twenty nine years. Um, so, what specifically do you teach there? And you know, what do you hope to get from your students? What do you tell them? What do you ask them to do? I mean, how does that work? Well, originally I was hired to teach ceramics to head up the ceramics program. Um, there was a professor there before me who was um, set to retire, so I was hired there to kind of take over that program. Um, so I and I teach all aspects of ceramics. Um, mainly sculpture and pottery, but I also teach glaze, calculation, glaze science, um, kiln technology, kiln, kiln theory. Um, I'm a specialist in atmospheric firings. Those are like salt soda firings, uh, pit firings, raccoon firings, and then installations and beyond. I mean, I really teach anything. Um, any, really, anywhere a student's idea can take the medium to a new direction, I'm all about that. Um, I also teach graduate level critique seminars. Um, I work with grads individually in multi-disciplines. Um, and this semester I'm teaching an undergraduate professional practice class. Do you, do you ask your students to, to focus on environmental art, or, or can they do anything? No, anything, not necessarily. I, I don't really push what I'm doing on them uh-huh. at, at the time. You know, I, I, do, so I do occasionally show slides of my own work, but it's not about me, really. It's about them. Yeah, but, but you don't make them go out and look at what you've done? Um, if, if it's local, yeah, I mean, that, that could be possible. I mean, if I, I have something that they can get to. Um, I, you know, I show stuff all over the country, so it's not always possible for them to see it sure. live. Sure, uh-huh. um, yeah. uh-huh. <clears throat> and then well, your the second half of that was what do you w- hope for? Yeah, yeah, students? yeah. Well, you know, mainly I want them to succeed. Like they're they're going to art school. They're 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 you know they really want to get a degree and have something come out of that. So they're looking for some kind of job or career or some way to make money as an artist, which is you know a, you know it's a small field for success. But I try to get the most of them to find something that will really work for them. Um, a lot of them come in and, and you know, they want to teach. So some, some of them graduate and they're teaching in K-12. through I have students that have graduated, they're teaching at university levels with tenure-track jobs. Um, some have opened community studios. There's a number of them in San Francisco that are my, for, my former students that have opened community um, ceramic studios. And then uh, there's some that are professional potters. And then studio artists and also community activists. Well, that sounds that all sounds really great. Um, I mean, so so this is these are students who are pursuing a degree in a specific uh, in a specific area, right? Yeah, they're you know they're getting a they're getting a bachelor's in art, studio art, uh-huh, uh-huh. and then uh, and also MFA in uh, studio art. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, yeah. so the bi- biography on your website reports that you first came west from New York in 1983 with a prefer- proverbial gu- guitar in hand but soon gravitated to ceramics. I mean, what, what were you hoping to achieve when you, you know, coming out to San Francisco? And, yeah. you know, how did you get into ceramics then? 
Yeah, the ceramic thing kind of just kind of happened. It's kind of a chance thing. My, you know, my first creative beginnings were in music, and um, I was uh, living in the East Village. I was, you know, I'm a guitar player, and I was a songwriter. And I used to, you know, play on the street in the East Village, uh, you know, oh. solo guitar with yeah. a harmonica and everything. And that was actually a pretty good living. I could make some good money um, if I found the right spots to go, the time and the right spots to go. Um, I met a lot of jazz musicians in Washington Square Park. I was exposed to a lot of street art at the time. Um, back then in the 80s, it was, you know, break dancers were just set up on the street. There were also like classical quartets, jazz musicians, saxophone players. Um, and, you know, I also, I started seeing, like, art in all, in all kinds of different art. Even though I was a guitar player, I started seeing art everywhere in New York. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. Some of the first street artists that I saw back then were, like, Keith Haring started there at that time, and he was painting his work on the sidewalks. And then Charles huh. Simmons was making these dwelling things and, like, cracks and the bricks and stuff. And so I kind of got, you know, exposed to visual art as well at that time. Um, I was, and then after I was in the village, I started attending a university at uh, State University of New York at Purchase, and I was studying music. I was taking voice classes and music composition, um, playing guitar and piano. And then I had a like a break in my schedule where I needed to get a class, so I saw a ceramics class. And it was like, because I had the space open. I was like, I'll take ceramics, that ought to be fun. So I took that class, and, it, you know, I, it was really great because when I was studying music, it was always with other musicians, with composition. There was always kind of like these debates on how things should go and how songs should go and how I should sing and all these things. And when I took ceramics, it was just me, you know, making a pot. And it just felt so satisfying to uh-huh. me, like, all by myself, like, creating. Um, so... Um, I was at that, that I went to that class, and then I decided to move to San Francisco um, to play music. And uh, you know, I was a street musician in New York, and so I wanted to move. I picked San Francisco because a lot of my band, my favorite bands, I guess from the '70s, from high school and stuff, all came out of San Francisco. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I want to go there yeah. and see if I can make it. You know, so I just I sold everything I owned and moved to San Francisco with my guitar and the suitcase and. Uh, I looked for, like, other songwriters. I was writing a lot of songs at the time. So um, I started doing that, and it was really a chance thing that, um, you know, I wanted to be a rock star, so I'm trying to form a band, trying to play music, I'm working part-time jobs. But I had a friend who was going to the Academy of Art in San Francisco, and uh, she encouraged me to apply to go to art school. So I applied, and I I got in, and then I took another ceramics class, with you know, my really my first ceramics professor, his name was Bill Abright, and he really kind of changed my my direction. Like where he, he saw that I had like this talent with the material, and he started really asking me questions like, "What am I doing with it? What am I doing with my talent?" And so, sort of giving me, pointing me in some direction um, that would you know kind of steer me into furthering my education and learning more about ceramics. I really you know started to love ceramics. Because he did, and he was, you know, he was fearless. Like, he would take us all to the beach and build a big fire, and we'd put a bunch of pots in it. I just thought that was so crazy. He, we were doing, like, these raku firing in downtown San Francisco, and the fire department would come, you know, like, one of the yeah. people were saying, oh, this is like, I thought he was so great. Like, he's such a rebel, you know, this is a, such a rebellious thing to do ceramics. So I just got hooked from that at that point on. So that's kind of how I got into it. It's like a chance thing. Yeah, sounds sounds interesting. I need to take a break, okay? Uh, Okay. You're listening to KSQD 90.7 FM in Santa Cruz and ksqd.org streaming on the Internet. You're listening to Sustainability Now, as the, uh, the as Emily said, and this is Ronnie Lipschitz. My guest today is Jeffrey Downing, UC San Francisco State Professor of Art. His specialization is ceramic and environmental art, and we've just been talking about how he got into the field. So, Jeff, uh, that same self-same bio attributes much of your later interest to your early maritime experiences which relied on looking and seeing in order to navigate along the East Coast. So, I mean, I take that as being an important element, right? Looking and seeing at seeing nature, looking at and seeing nature 
in order to uh, to sort of shape what you do. Can you can you tell us about those experiences and how they connect to or inspire your art? Yeah, sure. Um, I think you know, learning to see is one of the most important thing an artist can have. And I, you know, from those early experiences, learning like really learning to de- see things far away and define what they are. Um, my father was a sailor, uh, and I have I had a brother and a sister, and we would go out for like weeks at a time on a small sailboat offshore, and we, you know our charge was to find markers and find things so we knew where we were. Um, this is before GPS, so you had to really navigate by you know by charts and um, the compass, and even in, uh, my dad you know read the stars with a sextant. Um, but we you know we were like we needed to find markers, we needed to find buoys, um, even landmarks on shore like towers, water towers were important. They were all listed on the charts. So I really, like, I really was into like studying the charts and finding out exactly where we were. Um, most of the concerns was like you want to know where you are, especially on the East Coast when you're sailing near shore because there's rocks everywhere and there's shallow water, and you don't want to hit those. So you need to see these markers. Um, so learning to see those was like kind of eye training for me, um, you know. And the visuals became important in my work, um, you know, like stripes and checkers. Um, even, you know, even lights and even sounds to some extent, like horns and gongs and bells. Those are all those things those, that those navigational markers gave off. And all of it had a meaning. Like every every stripe had a meaning. Even a horn, like like how many times a horn goes off for how long, how many seconds. A bell, the sound of a bell. Um, those all had a meaning, and you could all read it from the chart. So it was kind of like it was like this code that that you could read or hear. And it was all coded in to have a meaning. And that became important in my work, like kind of the hidden code in my patterning and my colors and my stripes. It was sort of like this hidden code meeting that if you study it, you can understand it. Now, not everybody knows like marine charts and everything, and I'm not really accurate to those, but just like trying to encode messages in my, in my surface treatments. Um, and when I was first, like one of the first sculptures I ever made was um, a lobster buoy. I was a commercial fisherman in New York, and I, in order to get a commercial lobster license, you had to design a, a buoy that with some sort of stripe or pattern mm-hmm. on it that was identifiable, for, you know, for, by the Coast Guard or whatever, or from or other fishermen. And so, I designed this simple yellow buoy with a black stripe, and I, I felt so good when it, my license application came back and it said, "This is your buoy," and I was like, "Oh, I have an official lobster buoy." Um, and so sometimes that, even that buoy, kind of makes its way back into my artwork as sort of a, this icon of my first thing, that my first huh. sculpture coming back. Huh. Um, I think, you know, a lot of that came into my work even more when I started making public art, meaning work to be um, exhibited outside the gallery or the museum. Um, one of my first public art sculpture exhibits was a, uh, in a place, uh, um, an exhibit in Key West, Florida, and it's right on the water. It's a it's a it's a national park that's called Fort Zachary Taylor State Park. Um, it's a state park, and then I, ha- I was had to make sculpture there, but I wanted it to be seen by sea since there were boats that went by. There were cruise ships, sailboats going by because it's kind of the entrance of the harbor. So I wanted my work to be seen by sea, also by land from people working there. So I pre- sort of brought this kind of high visibility colors and patterns into the work there um and you know it's, it looks like navigational markers not officially but they would be noticeable from far away um and then even even that in that key west show which i participated in for several years um i started to think about the environment too that i was working in um how my work was impacting the environment how we kind of relate to nature um and also responding to environmental forces. One of the pieces that I had there was a um, piece that was a response to the, the Hurricane Katrina catastrophe, and I think it was in 2005. But the piece I actually made was a, it was a tall public art piece, but it had a, um, a moving, uh, like a turntable on top, and there was actually a dog mounted on the top of it, which was <laughs> in the shape of a weather vane. So the dog actually moved with the wind. So 
you could tell, like, when the winds change, you could see the dog pointing in another direction. There was a compass outline below it. So it was sort of an indicator of storms approaching. Huh. Well, we're going to talk about dogs a little bit later. Um, okay. So now your, your most recent project is Level Up, a sculptural view of sea level rise. And you created it during a residency at the Marin Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, are you still uh, in residence there, or was that uh, last year? Yeah, I'm, what, I'm still here. I'm in, I'm in my studio right now, and I'm, I'm, that, this is my last month, so I'm finishing up. Um, my show is up from uh, the second week in November, and it just came down um, right before uh, that Christmas, right, right after Christmas time. Um, so, yeah, that, uh, that project... Um, you know, it's, I was really interested when, when I came here to the residency to, I was still thinking, I'm still thinking about water and navigate navigation. So I wanted to really do something about water in California specifically. Um, and so I started thinking about, you know, what are our water issues? Of course, you know, drought is the biggest one. Um, you know, we're been in major drought for years. And then, um, that was one thing, but I also th thought about tidal flooding too, because, we're experiencing sea level rise, you know, caused by climate change, uh, climate change, and in you know everywhere in the world. But and there's places here, and especially in Marin County, um, where I live, there's um, I see sea level, see, I see climate change affecting the sea level and sea level rise, um, exacerbated by the king tides every year. So um, when when I first moved to Marin, I, I rented a house that was on a small peninsula right on the harbor and there was one day it came out and there was you know 12 inches of water in the driveway there and i didn't really oh. know what that was i'm like why is the tide so high and it turned <laughs> out that was a king tides and uh -huh. so i i really didn't heard of it before this was you know years ago but i thought you know king tides is a really great you know people are kind of shocked by it like what is this but they don't really know you know you know, some people have heard of king tides, and they know it comes and goes, but they don't. They don't see it as like what what it's showing us. Like the king tides, they're a natural. King tides are natural. They're not caused by climate change. They're caused by the moon and the and and the sun being aligned with the earth. Um, and they happen in this area. They happen twice a year. So, but they're natural. But when they do happen, they raise the sea level, the high tide level, beyond where it normally goes, and it gives us kind of a glimpse at what sea level rise will look like in years to come. So I thought I should make some work that I can put out in the King Tides and people will see it and they will ask, what is that doing there? What's, how, why are you putting work in the water? And I'm trying to show them and educate them about the threat of sea level rise that's imminent. Um, so um, I had already done a project that, about drought and two years before, so I always really want to do this tide piece, um, and it kind of it kind of keyed into my um, my sailing days. Mostly, you know, my, my sailing days was mostly fear of low tides, you know, rocks and running <laughs> the ground. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. But I just wanted to I wanted to start with, you know, in the residency start start out right away. The first month of my residency was last year, 2020 of January, and that was the that was the King Tides event. So I didn't really have a finished ceramic piece that I wanted to put in. So I need to quickly kind of make something that I can go out because I what I first wanted to do was document like where am I going to put my piece and where is it going to get the most attention. So I mm -hmm. made these wooden models, just wooden models like with a cinder block on them, like these towers that I took in my truck and at the King Tides, within like a you know a period of about 45 minutes, I went and I installed them in the King Tides, took pictures, put them back in my truck, went to the next location, installed them, took pictures, put them back in my truck. So I did it in six different places. And really I wanted to see like where would it attract the most like attention from people, from pedestrians or people passing by. And I really did find a good spot and this is this is in Sausalito, uh, Mill Valley, Sausalito. There's a path there that um, is a very popular path for bikers and joggers and people walking their dogs. And there, you know, just hundreds of people are going by. So there, there was a really great spot, like a high visibility. And also people would stop and ask questions. And part of me putting the work in is like actually putting the work in the water with waders on. And people are like, what's that guy doing? You know, like, is, that, is this yeah. a science <laughs> experiment? Or, well, you know, uh -huh. so, and 
And then I'm there to answer questions. And they're like, this is actually about sea level rise. And do you know about it? And do you know that this is a King Tides event happening right now? And so I'm kind of like, as an educator, I'm there, you know, talking about it. Um, huh. So yeah. let's see, I made those models. And then, then I had time to make the ceramic works, which are, you know, heavier, more cumbersome to move around. But, you know, the King Tides comes every year, so I had till next November, which was this past November, where I actually installed the ceramic ones in the bay and for the King Tides. And that's kind of what attracted the Chronicle's attention was the ceramic ones, because they were there for not, you know, still one day, but they were there for longer. And that kind of the, the, the show of me putting them up is part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, can, yeah can you so, describe what they looked like? Just for people who, who didn't kind of see like, the... They're um, obelisk shape. Like, t- their towers are about eight feet tall. And they're, you know, they're wider at the bottom, and they get skinnier at the top, so they're like spears. The top of them, each, each one has a different kind of top, which sort of um, resembles a navigational marker. Oh, and I, okay. the, the yeah. shapes are almost made-up shapes, but I'm thinking about markers, like what they look like. You know, that kind mm-hmm. of navigational markers are a lot like our street signs. Like a stop sign has a certain shape. You know, a certain type of yield sign has a certain shape. So navigational markers are the same. So I kind of based them off of that. But I also was kind of that was I had my freedom to kind of make them whatever I wanted. Like it wasn't exact navigational marker. They were kind of my own marker shapes um so yeah the, and this one this particular installation has five of them and i kind of place them about three or four feet apart so they kind of stick up out of the water they're um based off of tidal gauges so that they're striped like tidal gauges um they're black and white striped and so as you look at them in the water you can see the water rising and falling on the black and white stripes and part, also part of the work is that they reflect into the water so when you see them in a high, ref- like a, in a water when it's not uh, wavy or windy, if you can see them, and they almost double themselves in, uh, as a reflection. Yeah, sure. Um, uh-huh. And with the uh-huh. waves, they kind of the waves kind of abstract them. So, I've gotten several different you know photographs of them in different types of water, and you know it's it's you know quite beautiful to see them like that too. Even though they have this kind of purpose of you know they attract attention to people because they they look good and then. They have, then people go, oh, I see what you're doing. This is about sea level rise. Um, did you, did you have dad, any? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, did you have to get. It was right, right before the museum show opened, and I brought some signs out there. One sign uh-huh. was about, like, what is a king tide and what causes it? And another one, you know, kind of information signs that I made. And another one was about what is sea level rise. And What's going to? What is? What's the predictions of sea level rise? Which is kind of shocking when people really see that. Um, you know, most people don't really think about it unless you live by the water or live at sea level. You're not really thinking about it, but it's going to impact everybody because it's it's you know the, the sea is going to inundate the land and it's going to impact especially you know where where I'm here where I'm doing it. The, you know, the biggest thing is going to be the loss of estuaries and marshland, and then also you know, flooding of the roads, and it's going to cause traffic. Did Did you have to get any kind of permission to do this from any uh, authority or or office or something like that? Yeah, you know, I I originally kind of was going down that those channels and working, you know, with the county, um, and it was difficult to get all authorities. There was several entities that have to be on board with it, and it was really difficult to get, you know, everybody to approve of it, um, uh, uh, mainly because there's so many different jurisdictions. I mean, I learned that, yeah. you know, like, for instance, the path that I put it on, put it next to is the county. But when the ocean comes over it, it becomes a federal jurisdiction. So it was too many, there was too <laughs> much bureaucracy to get permission. So I just kind of did it and I yeah, took it yeah. down and I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't affect the environment. I didn't put it on top of any... Mm anything or crush any plants or I just put it right in the mud there. So um, I thought that was the best way to do it because otherwise it may take years to get the permission. So I actually like just doing the click exhibit too. It's like put it up and then take it down and there's nothing left and nothing there and nobody's worried about it. it just was, Listen, it's temporary. We have yeah. to take another break. Like, you know, <laughs> drive-by sculpture or something. Yeah, yeah. 
we have to take another break, okay? And and okay. Uh, I, I have a couple of ideas I want to run by you after the break. Okay. Uh, you're listening right. to KSQD 90.7 FM and KSQD.org, streaming on the Internet. Uh, you're listening to Sustainability Now. I'm Ronnie Lipschitz. My guest today is Jeff Downing, uh, professor of ceramic art at the University, uh, San Francisco State University. We're talking about his most recent installation uh, in the Marin County of, of what would you call them? Uh, tidal measure devices, <laughs> sculptures. Yeah, tidal, tidal, um, markers. There's tidal markers. On tidal markers, yeah. So, so I had a couple of, you know, as I'm listening to you, the first idea is, you know, there's a trail all the way around the bay, and it would be really wonderful to be able to put a whole sequence of these markers al along that trail. Um, but that sounds like a lifetime uh, of work. Um, and, you know, and, go on. I mean, it can take some time. I mean, now that I have the pieces made and I have the images of them installed, it gives, like, officials, like, a you know, a better idea of what they're going to look like. You know, they yeah, really want sure. to know exactly what it's going to look like and what they're going to have to deal with. Like, who who would complain about that? You know, like, they, they have to deal with all those entities, right? Yeah, right, so, right. And and the other one was a was an art project that I had uh, thought about, which was putting markers on people's front yards. You know, people who are near the water, to show them where the tide line tidal line will be in fifty years or a hundred years, um, which is sort of similar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I, those ideas I'm, I have going in my head to. I'm yeah. Okay. To continue this work because I feel like it's really meaningful, and you know about the awareness of it, and especially people living by the water. I think they're more aware of it. Um, you know, people that live in Florida, for example, they're definitely aware of you know sea level rise issues, and um, you know even like the city of Miami. I mean, it's pretty much what you know. It's adaptability. Like Miami has you know, pumps all over the city to pump water out. Like when the ocean comes in, they try to pump it out. And, yeah. So that you know, it's kind of adapting at this point because you know, it's going to be hard to stop it because it's happening and it's it's, it's happening at a faster pace. So adapting to it is you know m you know moving inland and then trying to protect the you know the the marshlands around you know around communities because those are like a, they absorb like like storm surge and even sea level. Like if you, if you take those away and you just build seawalls, then storm surge is going to take it away. Yeah. The, you know, the, the natural yeah. marshlands are protectors of the land. So, um, you know, with that kind of awareness, I mean, communities are definitely working on, on programs to do it. Um, maybe too slow and too expensive to keep everybody where they are now. Um, people are going to have to, you know, move. You know, it, um, it's like the, 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 prediction is, um, you know, by 2100, it, the, the sea level is going to be, the high tide is going to be almost three feet higher than it is now. Wow. Wow. Um, the the, the uh, bio I quoted earlier, uh, no, the blurb referred to your work uh, as leading us to a better understanding of the nature between, connection between culture and nature. So how is that connection expressed in your sculptures? Yeah, I think, you know, as humans, we need nature to survive. We need air, water, you know, we need land to live on. But at the same time, you know, we continue to consume it and destroy it and exploit it, you know, for profit. Um, you know, destroying the rainforest, for example, or, you know, burning fossil fuels to cause climate change. Um, I'm, I'm also referring to animals, too, when, I, when I'm saying that, is that, you know, with animals, too, we consume them, exploit them, destroy them. Um, but still, you know, with animals, we we for as, as as beings we forge connections with them, um, wild and domestic. I'm thinking about like Jane Goodall's work with gorillas. And, you know, our domestic animals, our beloved pets, our cats and our dogs, um, horses, goats, other animals. Um, you know, I think that those connections are important, and we really, um, you know, my hope my hope is that by seeing those connections, we can. You know, help people understand, you know, nature and environments more. Um, in in my work, I think um, I'm trying to, um, you know, using animals as subjects, for example. Um, I, you know, trying to express that kind of things about animals that not everybody realizes. I, I'm I'm thinking about a series I did 
um, some years ago called The Spirit of the Horse, where um, I had a friend who was boarding horses up in Northern California, and she had a, a small, a, 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 I don't know, a young horse, a young horse that she was, that wasn't trained yet. So she had a whip and she was holding the horse and like kind of, and I said, what are you doing? She's like, I'm breaking the spirit of the horse so we can put a saddle on it eventually. And okay. horses had the spirit, like they don't want to be saddled, but uh, all horses that are saddled, somehow the spirit had to be broken of the horse. It couldn't be wild. It had to be like force, forcefully domesticated. I guess we do that with dogs and cats too, you know, training them to live in the house. Um, but it really, you know, I, I made a piece about that, like about the horse actually not having a human ride, it, but it actually it, it, its spirit rides it, rides itself. Um, so, and then, you know, I, yeah, I, you know, I have this ongoing series of dogs. I'm doing personifying human activities too. So, trying to, you know, remind people of the connections that we have with with nature and animals in my work. You know, my you know, through my environmental sculpture is a you know nature part, and then the the animals that I make is a you know sort of the, the animal part connection. Well, let's talk about dogs. I had that as a something I wanted to follow okay. up. So you've done a lot of of uh, ceramic dogs, and you know, well, on the one hand, dogs are natural beings, right, like people. But on the other hand, they're culturally bred and socialized. Um, so you know, the dogs that we see when we're going for walks. Do you have a dog? I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you know, so so they come in all shapes and sizes. And they've been bred, and so there's a sense in which they're cultural, cultural beings. So, so my question is, you know, first of all, what kind of dog sculptures do you do, or have you done? And the second is that, what can dogs, both real and ceramic, tell us about ourselves? That is, humans as as similar beings. Okay. Yeah. Um. You know, I think you know. I try to, you know, with my dogs, I try to, um, you know, I, I, make, I make these series of, you know, life-size standalone dogs. I also do these narratives with dogs. And so what I'm trying to kind of relate to is like dogs, like, in, in, for example, the narrative dogs with, in the, they're usually in a kind of an in a, in a, in a environment, an atmosphere or a scene. And really they're kind of personifying them as in human activities to show like emotions and tasks. Um, and then like in this, in the standalone dogs that I make, it's like about these like kind of things that dogs do, like dog waiting, dog guarding, dog protecting, even dogs loving, you know, like, um, in my statement, I say like how dogs have developed a way to communicate with us. Like they, they, dogs, I think, especially of all animals, they've, they've really kind of developed this way to communicate with humans and understand our language and communicate with us and then um, give and by doing that we we're kind of we're into we're, we're connecting with nature when they're communicating with us we're connecting with this natural world through the dog which yes is domesticated but it's still you know an animal and um, I think you know of all animals humans connect with dogs the most I mean I, or most people are you know who have dogs really find themselves like connected to their dogs and that's nature to me it's a dog is a natural being um, and to some extent cats and birds and horses and other animals too but um, I think you know what we learn from dogs is you know like instinct and you know like other things are like you know to like when you think about dogs like that to learn to like live in the moment like dogs don't think about the past like they forget the past really really easily um they, they're just living in the moment they're not even living in the future they don't know what that is so they're not worried about it they're living in the moment so i think that's really important to remind ourselves to do that too and then you know also about dogs it's like they don't hold grudges you know they're they're not necessarily mad at you for very long um and they also like dogs are like dogs you know they're okay being who they are, like in their own bodies. You know they're they're not jealous of other kinds of dogs or what other kinds of dogs look like or what they smell like. They're they're like okay being just a dog, so it's a kind of accepting themselves. Um, and then also like you know one thing about dogs is that they're they they seem to be like always loyal and dependable because they're you know naturally they're pack animals. So I think about my dog. It's like my dog thinks my, my family is her pack. Like 
and she's really happy when we're all together. When one of us is missing, she's she knows one of the pack is like not there, you know. So they're they're like pack animals, and so I guess it reminds us to think about our you know our pack, whether it be our family or our close friends. So really think about them and that, think about that togetherness. I mean, right now we can't have as much as we want, but to, you know, dogs remind us of that, like how how that is, and I think especially with dogs, it's like you know, unconditional love. Like they just love you, whatever you know. You don't you don't have to earn a dog's love as long as you're you're there and they love you. You know, and I I found that with you know the dog I have right now is a, a Chesapeake Bay Retriever, and I grew up with Chesapeakes um, because they're water dogs, and yeah. my dad you know, was a sailor, so he wanted to, you know, he, initially we had German Shepherds, but they didn't like the water or the dock very much. <laughs> so he researched uh-huh. it and found that, well, what's the strongest swimming dog? It was the Chesapeake Bay Retriever. And I just remember, you know, growing up in high school with the Chesapeake, that they were so loving, you know, and I know all dogs are, but I especially remember the Chesapeake. So, you know, later on, I moved to California, I didn't have a dog for years, and you know, we were deciding to, my wife and I were decided, and my daughter were deciding to get a dog, and I just remembered the Chesapeake, and so we started looking into it, and, you know, it's, they're, they're just great dogs, and it's, it's the love, too, like, I just remember the, the dog that I had in high school, and this dog just is full of love, so um, it's amazing. Um, so that's what I think we can learn from dogs, like, just to kind of remember, like, just the moment of the day, and, and you know, you know, playing, and, and then, you know, like, trading fear for love like you know dogs can you know dogs can be fearful and you know even even aggressive if they if they've been treated badly but you know even rescue dogs who've probably you know, had probably some rough times once they're rescued they can be you know trained back to being you know loving creatures again you know they can trade that out and i think we can learn from them too that they they can do that and we can do that too um, I want to take another break, even though we haven't been going on for so long, and, and then we'll come back uh, and finish up the show. You're listening to KSQD 90.7 FM on your radio dial and ksqd.org, streaming on the Internet. Okay, you're listening to Sustainability Now. This is Ronnie Lipschitz. My guest today is Jeffrey Downing, professor of art at San Francisco State University and environmental artist. We've just been talking about dogs, which is one of the... Uh, uh, topics that, that Jeff sculpts. And, you know, Jeff, I, I, I'm not sure that everybody who does research on dogs would necessarily agree with some of the things that you said about, you know, about memory and, and the future. Um, but let's, let's let that go for a moment. Uh, it, 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 one of the things as you're talking, however, is that uh, comes, to, comes to mind is that you know, we often say that dogs look like their owners, but but owners interact with their dogs in ways that that shape them, shape their personalities, their temperaments, uh, to what the owner would like, right? And if if you find if you get a dog that won't do that, the relationship is never quite so good. Um, and I, this is not, you know, I'm not asking you to comment on it. I was just just reflecting on on that particular particular feature but but you know i mentioned the, the thing is though that that dogs you know i said humans are cultural beings right um even though we're biological and and dogs are the same way and so i'm just a bit curious how do you think about, i asked you this earlier but what is the difference the distinction between that culture and nature from your perspective and in your art well i mean i think culture is something that we've created as humans we've created a culture around us you know wherever it be you know however we live whatever we rely on to make that culture you know like artwork for example is a cultural thing or um you know you know where we live how we live um i think you know in animals don't necessarily create that for themselves they they live in the environment they live in they don't build things or make things to make it better. They just live where they are. And um, I think that's something. And culture is also a, a, a way we communicate with each other as humans um, through, you know, events or places that we travel to or, 
things like that. So um, I think that that's the difference. I think culture is, you know, human related, you know. Um, you know, I think, I, I guess animals could have a cultural, cultural too, but I, I think about culture as human you know, when I'm talking about it, I'm thinking about it as like our culture as humans, like our our human environment relating yeah, to a sure. natural environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah no, it, it makes sense. I was, just, I was just thinking about how we relate to dogs versus coyotes, right? And um, the way in which coyotes, a lot of coyotes are products of the environment, the human environment in which they live as well. But we certainly mm-hmm. don't have uh, friendships with coyotes. Whereas we do with dogs, and they, again, reflect um, the environment, the cultural environment in which they live. You know, this is, I'm just, I'm just nitpicking here, uh, because I'm yeah, really... I think it's because they were, they were domesticated, and it was successful. I mean, yeah. I people, you know, people try to domesticate zebras, but they just don't do it, you know? Right, right, so right. It's like dogs did it, and they adapted yeah. it. Well, zebras didn't come around to the fire to get fed, right? That was the, that was the <laughs> difference, right? Um, I guess that was what it was. Um, so uh, do, you, do you represent vari- variation in the dogs that you sculpt? I mean, I, you know, the pictures that I saw seemed to suggest that most of the dogs were more or less the same size. Do you, and, and the reason I ask this is that, uh, well, I said, I saw someone mention somewhere that uh, while 2020 was a lousy year for people, it was a great year for dogs. And I certainly have seen a lot more dogs out and about, you know, taking their owners for walks. And I find it fascinating that they come in so many different shapes and temperaments. And, and I'm wondering, do you represent that kind of variation in your dogs? Yeah, I find that fascinating, too. And I actually have seen a lot of owners or dogs with their owners from the window of my studio like all day long and they're going by yeah yeah it's amazing you know how many different kind of dogs are and i think that's what really kind of got me on making dogs from the start i you know originally i think i you know i was a figurative sculptor i was making human figures but i had an interest in abstraction and you know, there were there were some artists that I was looking at that you know were able to abstract the human figure, and it worked. And you know, I tried and I did it some to some extent, but somehow sometimes I looked at the work and it didn't work. Like I abstracted it, but it looked deformed or it looked off some way. Um, it wasn't until I made a self portrait with a dog that I made the dog and I was able to abstract the dog, and it really worked. And, and I think the reason is because you can make a dog with short legs, and it's it, it works because there's dogs with short legs, so you can make it a right. long dog or a tall dog. Because when you look at all the different kinds of dogs, they're still dogs. So abstracting yeah. the dog yeah. became like really successful for me because it it, it didn't change like what it was. In other mm-hmm. words, like it, so, um, and so yeah, definitely, definitely, um, the variation is something that I I like. My, you know, the dogs, most of the dogs I make are sort of are uh, come from uh, like their own breed. Um, like I haven't done a lot of really small, do- like portraits of small dogs. I haven't actually done a real dog. I really only made one, like a mm-hmm. real portrait of a dog. Um, all, all my dogs are abstract versions of a dog. But I do like certain types of like the German Shepherd nose, and um, you know the Retrievers. Um, I'm, I'm really into like the Sight Hound, sort of slinky body, like long, little lean bodies um, mm-hmm. that show a lot of bones and muscles and stuff. So yeah, I kind of take into a, I guess, a style that I'm making them, um, even though each one's totally different. Um, but I, you know, I have. I mean, I've done over. I've made over a hundred standalone dogs and so looking at them they they really take on their character only at the end when i add like ears and the mouth like it's uh-huh. really when i think about the dog i had this thing i call dogness which is really <laughs> about like the face of the dog you know yeah. and it's like that's the temperament is like the face of the dog and you know it's all about that mug the dog's mug you know how yeah, they you know yeah, smile yeah. or even with the mouth closed they have like this face that shows a temperament. So right. when I make it a dog, I make the body, 
but when I put the face on it, then it kind of comes alive and becomes its own thing. And then it's uh-huh. like, then, oh, mm-hmm. then I have a name for it all of a sudden. You know, but I can't name it before I finish the face. So I see yeah. that like yeah. character in it, that temperament that you talked about. Okay, well, listen, we're, we're just about out of time, and so I want to thank you for being my guest on Sustainability Now. Oh, thank you for having me. So if you're interested uh, in Jeff and his art, you can find out more by going to the podcast on ksqd.org, uh, which will be posted tomorrow, and following the links in the blurb, uh, and they'll le- lead you to various sites on the web. Um, My guest on Sunday, January 24th, will be California State Senator John Laird, who has just begun his term in office. He represents Senate District 17, which includes Santa Cruz and San Luis Obispo Obispo counties in their entirety, as well as portions of Monterey and Santa Clara counties. Laird's political career began in 1981 on the Santa Cruz City Council, and it included stints in the State Assembly and uh, in Jerry Brown's second administration. We're going to talk about energy, environment, and similar issues of import for California, and and maybe something about uh, national environmental politics as well. So that's Sunday, January 10th, 5 to 6 p.m., right here on KSQD 90.7 FM and ksqd.org, streaming on the Internet. As a reminder, shows from the 5 to 6 p.m. Sunday slot are rebroadcast the following Tuesday mornings from 6 to 7 a.m. And if you'd like to listen to previous shows, you can find them at ksqd.org backslash sustainability now and Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Pocket Casts, among other podcast sites. So everybody, thanks for listening, and thanks to Emily Dunham for today's engineering, and thanks to everyone else at the station who make KSQD your community radio station. Until next every other Sunday, sustainability now. Every second breath you take is coming from the sea And we don't really know Cause we don't really